Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. What makes for a stereotypical librarian? Personally, I tend to picture a cozy sweater, ink-stained hands, and tea. So much tea. Of course, these kinds of stereotypes are left over from a time when the librarian might be a woman who was thought to be a bit dowdy. Belle de Costa Green certainly did not fit that mold. In fact, Belle de Costa Green didn't fit really into any mold in the early 20th century. She was born Belle Marion Greener in 1879 in Washington, D.C., to parents who were prominent and well-liked in their community. Her mother, Genevieve Ida Fleet, was a music teacher from a prominent local black family, and her father, Richard Theodore Greener, was the first black graduate of Harvard in the class of 1870. Her father was an activist in every sense of the word and wielded his education and intellect with pride, passing on a keen hunger for knowledge to his children, especially to Belle. Admittedly, she had a complicated relationship with her father. He left the family when she was 17, and it's not clear if Belle ever saw him again. The family was of mixed ancestry, and Belle herself was very light-skinned. To get ahead in a world that enforced segregation in every way possible, Belle changed her name to Green and made her middle name Da Costa, creating a story of Portuguese heritage to explain her darker complexion. It was Belle's position at the Princeton Library, though, that set her apart. She began working there in 1902 and came to the attention of one Junius Spencer Morgan II, the nephew of the infamous J.P. Morgan. Junius was a book lover and eventually introduced Belle to his uncle, who was looking for a personal librarian to manage and expand his collection. And even though Morgan was just trying to impress old money New York City, that didn't mean that he didn't want the best and most valuable and he needed someone with the tenacity to get it. He hired Bell in 1905 and charged her with taming the collection and then getting more. There always had to be more. Although libraries are commonly thought of as a woman's domain, remember our dowdy librarian stereotype, most high-level positions are occupied by men. Bell had her work cut out for her, and she handled it with her usual flair, often saying, and I quote, Just because I'm a librarian doesn't mean I have to dress like one. Belle traveled extensively to Europe, out-charming and outbidding the other collectors that came to jockey for positions in auctions and sales. She learned from the best in the field, and her word was as good as gold with European galleries, shops, and dealers. She was fashionable, formidable, a splash of color in a somewhat drab, male-dominated world. And Belle was also forthright, maybe even blunt, with her employees, and wasn't afraid to push Morgan when she was right, as she so often was. She acquired a staggering collection of rare books, manuscripts, and fine art for the Morgan Library. But her position became precarious when Morgan died in 1913. It could have all come crashing down in that moment, but Morgan's son, J.P. Morgan Jr., established the Pierpont Morgan Library as a public institution in 1924, and wasn't about to let a gem like Bell get away. Anyway, his father's will stipulated that Bell was to be kept on at the library with a salary of $50,000. She didn't just stay on as a librarian, though. She became the director. Under Bell's care, the Morgan Library blossomed into a significant public institution, and Bell herself was a respected figure who mentored colleagues and was the person to see about medieval art, particularly illuminated manuscripts. Because of that, institutions far and wide sought her counsel. But in 1930, she was needed a little closer to home. The Metropolitan Museum of Art wanted to purchase an extremely rare medieval panel painting by Spanish master Jorge Ingles. It was a gorgeous piece, showing the betrothal of St. Ursula. At first glance, it was perfect. A busy scene with the large crowd centered around St. Ursula and her would-be husband. However, Belle looked closer and realized that something was off. People have certain expectations when it comes to the Middle Ages, and this painting played into all of them. What no one realized that day in 1930 was that Bell had just uncovered one of the most successful and masterful forgers in history. 
As it turns out, the figure Bell dubbed the Spanish Forger had been busy, creating several medieval works for decades. Bell sought them out with the same single-minded focus she devoted to Morgan's collection. The paintings were too perfect, they were too decorative, and had too much gold leaf, something that was spare in actual medieval art. After almost a decade, Bell compiled a list of 14 items she confirmed to have been created by the Spanish forger. She retired in 1948 and died two years later. But her story is only just beginning to be explored and understood. The hunt for the Spanish forger continues to this day. Currently, the list of works attributed to them stands at over 300. But there's one last thing. A funny thing happened after Bell's discovery. The Spanish forger's art became just as valuable and sought after as the works they once sought to imitate. There are auctions for people to claim these pieces for their own, and thousands of dollars are exchanged. All for a pretty lie. We've never found out who the Spanish forger was. Thanks to Bella da Costa Green, we've certainly discovered a colorful mystery. Everyone has that one item in their house they're proud of. Maybe it's the 80-inch TV in the living room or their extensive collection of Hummel figurines. It could be an award or a vintage piece of furniture or even a prop from a famous movie. Whatever it is, it's something that brings them joy and acts as a conversation starter for when the guests come over. After all, who can ignore a TV almost as big as the wall? But Sadiq Mohammed Khan Abbasi IV didn't have a giant television set or a movie prop. What he had was a really nice bed. Abbasi was the Nawab of Bahawalpur, a princely state of the British Indian Empire. Bahawalpur wasn't technically governed by the British. Instead, it was overseen by the Nawab and controlled by the crown through indirect rule. Bahawalpur was located on the eastern edge of modern Pakistan. It was founded in 1609 AD, but didn't form a subsidiary alliance with Britain until 1833. As for Abbasi, Sources are conflicted. Some say that he was born in 1861, while others claim that he was born a year later. His father was Nawab at the time, but he sadly passed away in 1866 when Sadiq was only a boy. As the boy was still a minor at the time of his father's death, he was unable to assume the role and duties of Nawab. Instead, the British took temporary control until Abbasi came of age in 1879, at which point he was granted the title of 10th Nawab of Bahawalpur. In photographs, Abbasi appeared to be fairly tall, with a full beard and long, dark hair that fell past his shoulders. He had a taste for the finer things in life, often depicted wearing long, ornate jackets stitched with detailed filigree. And I will confess that I cannot help but picture Nandor the Relentless from what we do in the shadows, but you picture what you want to picture. But to get a true sense of his wealth and power, one need to look no further than his bedroom, because the bed on which he slept was no ordinary resting place. He had it commissioned in 1882 to be built out of rosewood, a strong wood with a deep, rich red hue. Then he had the bed covered in a third of a ton of sterling silver from the Christoffel Company in Paris. Christoffel was a renowned silverware company that had supplied kings and emperors with beautiful tableware dating back to the 1840s. When it introduced a new way of bonding thin layers of metal to their forks, knives, and spoons, they called it electroplating. The process was a huge boon to their business, too. But the Nawab didn't have his bed electroplated. Instead, he asked the company's designers to carve and engrave the sterling silver with delicate patterns and ornamentations to show everyone that this was a bed fit for a king. A rosewood bed covered in specially crafted sterling silver might have been enough for most wealthy nobles, but not Abbasi. He wanted more. And so on each of the four posts at the bed's corners, he had placed four life-size automatons cast from bronze. They were made by French artist Henri Bouillet and were modeled as four nude women of European descent, each wearing a dark wig and holding a feathered fan. Inside the posts on which they stood were springs that had been wired to a music box stored beneath the bed, and under the mattress was a pressure sensor that was triggered when Abbasi would crawl in at the end of a long, busy day. And when the sensor was activated, the four robotic women would move their eyes and wave their fans over him as a piece from a popular opera played for 30 minutes. Unfortunately, the current whereabouts of the bed 
are unknown. All that remains today are some photos taken by the Christoffel Company in 1882, as well as a watercolor painting of it by Carl A. Scoggard. Looking back, though, the Nawab's musical bed was more than just a display of extravagance and wealth. It was also a marvel of engineering and craftsmanship. To know it might still be out there, waiting for somebody to lay down and switch on its half-hour music show, well, that would keep anyone up at night. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.